Good morning, everyone. This is Melody Pazelt from the Healthcare Authority, and we'll get started in just another minute or two as folks are getting logged on. We have quite a record number of people interested in this webinar, and so we will um, have a full capacity. And so um, please be patient with us, and we will get started in just another minute. Thank you. Good morning, this is Melody Pazel from the Healthcare Authority. Um, just to let folks know that we will get started in just another minute or two as folks are getting logged on to the webinar. Um, we do have quite an overwhelming response. Um, just to make sure that we have audio is working well, uh, if you could raise your hand if you're hearing me. Um, the hand raise is just another um, tool within the GoToWebinar controls. Um, if you see on your little icon, there's a little hand that you can raise up. Um, so I'm seeing folks raising their hands. Thank you so much um, that you can hear me. So uh, thank you. And if you could now um, take your hands down by clicking that little hand button again. So if it is um, red, then the hand button is down. If it's um, green, then a hand button is up. Um, we'll get started in just another minute as folks are getting logged onto this, uh, the GoToWebinar platform. If you're not familiar with GoToWebinar, it's got quite a number of different features. Um, so you have your little grab bar that can um, uh, maximize or minimize your um, webinar controls. Um, we do encourage folks um, to uh, join via phone, uh, which is also uh, you have a choice of your computer audio or your phone. We will only be taking questions via the question pane today. Um, just fine with the large number of people that we have registered for the webinar that um, it will not be conducive to unmute people and ask questions verbally so that we will ask you to type your questions into the question box, into the question pane, and we will get to as many questions as we can. Um, really, thank you so much um, for your time today and uh, again, really appreciate uh, all of our presenters that are, are going to be sharing their information. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with GoToWebinar, you can raise your hand to ask a question or, or if you have issues. Um, we appreciate hearing that people can hear us and so um, by raising their hand to let us know that you can hear us. And so thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody that was able to do that. You'll also notice on the GoToWebinar um, that there are some uh, on the menu, let me go back one more page. Um, on the menu, you'll notice that there's also a, a menu for handouts, and we have already uploaded. We have already uploaded. Uh, Gail, I might ask you to go ahead and mute um, your phone, if that's all right. We're getting some feedback from, I think. Um, we have already uploaded copies of the webinar presentation, and so you can um, uh, download the webinar uh, PowerPoint already. And so, uh, and so with that, 
Um, again, uh, we have one quick thing that we'd like to do really quick, and that is to take a poll. We are getting some feedback from our presenters. So, um, Gail, I think I'm going to unmute you for a second. Oh, yeah. Melody, I am muted on my phone. Thank you, Gail. Uh, I've been sure. muted for a long time. Uh, you may have your. Uh, I'm not sure where we're getting the feedback from. So, uh, if we can make sure our panelists are muted. Um, okay, so I do want to um, la launch a poll really quick. Um, so we have a quick poll that we want to take uh, from our um, attendees. So the poll is uh, getting ready to launch. So you should see um, a quick poll that says, are you currently using telehealth for the delivery services you provide to the behavioral health population? And won't let me. Great. So let's um, let's go ahead and close the poll. So 66% of people are saying that they are using um, telehealth. 12% are saying no, and 22% are saying not yet. So thank you all so much for um, that. Just kind of gives us an idea of um, where we're at with um, folks. No, it kicked me out. I said I'm connected. I'm not connected. What the hell is all this? So I'm not sure actually who that is, who that is speaking, but um, everybody should be muted. And so I'm not sure who we have also that's talking right now. Um, so uh, Greg, why don't I turn it over to you? Okay, thanks, Melody. Uh, welcome, everybody. As, as Melody noted, we've we've had an overwhelming response this morning. We thank you very much for your interest in this morning's webinar. We want to let you know that this is going to be the first in a series of webinars supporting the telehealth implementation. It'll be followed by deeper dives into topics you help us identify through your feedback during and after today's webinar. Um, so in addition to uh, in the quick poll that you just participated in, there'll be a, a brief survey at the end, and we really hope you'll participate in that as well. Our presenters today are Sherry Lurch and Rachel Post. They're with Technical Assistance Collaborative, or TAC. TAC is one of our national PA providers. They've worked closely with us on implementing the Foundational Community Supports Program over the last couple of years, and they're also working with us on general sustainability planning for all of the initiatives in the Medicaid transformation. So Rachel and Sherry developed the content for today's webinar. They'll be handing off after today's webinar to a different TA team from the University of Washington, and they'll be developing and presenting the topical webinars that follow. By way of introduction, Sherry Lurch is a senior consultant with the Human Services Group at TAC. Sherry has over 30 years experience in the mental health and substance abuse service systems, ranging from direct service provision to system administration. Sherry draws on her past experience in the public sector in the areas of developing and implementing approaches to better meet the needs of individuals with mental illness and co-occurring physical health developmental and substance use disorders, justice system involvement and homelessness, providing holistic care for individuals with high risks, high needs, with a focus on addressing social determinants of health, 
assessing compliance with the Olmstead Act and identifying interagency and cross-systems approaches and solutions to resolve complex issues. Her areas of expertise include systems assessment, strategic planning, group facilitation, program development, and financing, and financing strategies. Rachel Post is a senior associate with the Human Services Group at TAC. Rachel has over 20 years of experience designing and implementing innovative, evidence-based, and nationally recognized programs that improve the social determinants of health for vulnerable populations, including those exiting homelessness and incarceration, and those with complex primary and behavioral health conditions. She designed and implemented the country's first evidence-based supported employment program for people with primary substance use disorders exiting homelessness, as well as Portland and Denver's first housing first teams targeted at individuals experiencing homelessness. More recently, Rachel has provided expertise on federally funded projects regarding housing-related supports and services for Medicaid-eligible individuals with SUD. Rachel has served as an adjunct professor at Portland State University and has engaged with federal, state, and local officials and with community-based organizations and coalitions to create and sustain successful policy programs and cross-system initiatives. I also want to note that Gail Krieger is, worth, is with us this morning. Gail is clinical nurse specialist here at the Healthcare Authority, and she will be a subject matter expert with us helping to respond to your questions. So thanks again for joining the webinar, and I will hand off now to Sherry and Rachel. Just before we get um, started, I just want to include, uh, make sure all of our attendees are muting their phone, either if, they've, if you've called in, please push star six. If you are on the computer, please make sure and mute your microphone. I'm not sure where the background noise is coming from because I, from my end, it looks like everybody is muted. So if you have called in, please make sure and star six your phone. Join Sorry. all of you um, this morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Just wanted to be sure. So, yes, we are going to provide a high level, broad based overview of the use of telehealth in behavioral health and recovery services. Uh, I know that many of you responded to the poll that you have um, had experience or are currently providing services via telehealth. Um, that's great. We understand though, that there are some who may not be and who this may be relatively new information for. We're going to try to give you again that, that broad overview uh, and knowing that there will be follow-up opportunities for you to get more technical, drilled down uh, guidance as well in the future. Uh, do you want to go ahead please, Melanie, with the next slide? So our purpose for today is to provide a brief overview. What is telehealth? I know many of you have uh, your own definition of what that is. We will share with you how we are describing and talking about telehealth today. We will be reviewing guidance from both SAMHSA as well as HHS, the Health and Human Services, around uh, how to use telehealth during the COVID-19 um, situation we are in today including considerations for substance use disorder providers. We will be going over some of the technology platforms, both those that are being um, issued through Washington, as well as some, some other opportunities that the guidance refers to. We'll be touching briefly on documentation of services. And then we will have a general overview of other considerations uh, and what we consider to be good practice, best practice, for using telehealth or other strategies that might be needed for behavioral health services during the response to COVID-19. Uh, we'll be going back and forth. I will be doing you know, part of the presentation. Rachel, my colleague, will be doing part of the presentation. And then we will 
open it up for about a half hour for questions and discussion at the, or questions at least, at the end of the uh, presentation. Next slide. So when we talk about, next slide two, when we talk about telehealth, what are we referring to today? For those of you who you know, have background or experience with telehealth, you may refer to it as telemedicine. When we are using the discussion today with the revised guidance that we will be talking about, we're referring to uh, the use of telecommunication technologies to support distance communication. That includes real-time audiovisual and audio-only telehealth. That means using the telephone as well. So both video and audio, audio and visual as well as audio-only communication. Lots of services now can be and are being promoted to be delivered via remote communication in response to safety concerns arising out of the COVID-19. Uh, environment. The other thing is that healthcare providers really are being encouraged and are able to serve individuals in good faith. And you'll hear me use that terminology uh, a couple times throughout my presentation through everyday communication technologies. And that can include things such as FaceTime, Skype, or the telephone during this uh, nationwide public health emergency. You'll also note at the bottom of some slides where we do have resources and citations in the actual slide deck. You will have copies of this, so you will be able to refer back to those resources if you have questions after the presentation. Next slide. Use of telehealth uh, has also, it, it's being promoted through the use of relaxed requirements and, and regulations. It's also being promoted through the use of expanded payment technology or payment approaches. So we are getting guidance from Medicaid and most insurance companies are now reimbursing for services that are completed via telehealth. That, a lot of uh, relaxation of the requirements and limitations on that. With Medicare, back uh, starting March 6th, actually, for the duration of the public health emergency, Medicare is paying for professional services uh, funded to beneficiaries all across the country, um, whether individuals are in a healthcare setting or they're in their home. CMS has their, um, delineated three types of communication. They describe telehealth, which is actually using an interactive audio, video, telecommunication system. They are also reimbursing for what they describe as virtual check-ins, which is a brief communication that can actually be initiated by the individual. It can also be initiated by the practitioner, but it is a, for a briefer period of time to check in. And they're also paying for e-visits, which includes the person, the individual accessing or communicating with their healthcare professional through uh, an, an online health portal. With Medicaid, Medicaid is reimbursing for any service that is otherwise already covered in your state plan or through potentially your managed care organizations in a face-to-face -face approach. So therapy sessions that were originally provided face-to-face -face can now be provided through telehealth. Um, intensive individualized uh, case management services that may have been provided or treatment services that may have been provided through face-to-face -face can now be provided through telehealth methodology. Any service that you can provide face-to-face -face is being covered and authorized to avoid that need for people to come into contact with each other. The Medicaid guidelines do say you have to act within your scope of practice. It doesn't mean that for sake of conversation, uh, an unlicensed person can now only do licensed activity. You must provide in good faith effort in the scope of your practice. Um, the guidance also allows for 
flexibility for healthcare providers to reduce or waive uh, cost sharing. If there's a co-payment or cost sharing that uh, an individual recipient of services uh, has been required to participate in before, that is being waived going forward. Next slide. So why are we doing this? What are the benefits of telehealth? I think we all realize that the whole idea around having remote communication is to protect and, and increase safety for practitioners as well as for individuals who are receiving services. We know that through social distancing, which we're being encouraged to do, or potentially for some individuals who are being quarantined, there is a greater risk for individuals to start to experience uh, anxiety and depression, to revert to substance use, to really feel social isolation. And telehealth is being promoted to help to maintain social distancing, but to be able to reduce the impact of that isolation, to maintain social connectedness, and to support continuity of care. We want people to continue to know that services and support are available to them. It's simply through uh, a different methodology. I also want to stress, we think it's important for telehealth to promote and support consumer education or service recipient education. Uh, we all have access to lots of resources and information that's coming across our, our desks and our computer screens daily. The people we serve don't necessarily always have that. So helping them to be informed, um, to help calm their anxieties by having information, valid information. It can help to counter some of the myths that are out there and really can help to reduce the likelihood that individuals will then uh, unwillingly participate in activities that could actually increase their risk of exposure. Next slide. So we're going to briefly review uh, guidance through HHS that they have issued around confidentiality uh, during the COVID-19 situation. This guidance is particularly around telehealth. Prior to the federal declaration of emergency, uh, as many of you know who have been participating in providing telehealth services, telemedicine services, there were pretty um, firm requirements around using certain technology, around uh, processes that ensured that individuals' health protected information uh, would be protected through very technical um, processes. But because of the result of the pandemic and wanting to encourage more providers, more individuals to use telehealth, some of these rules have been relaxed, and I, I will call it relaxed. The Office of Civil Rights, which normally reinforces protections under HIPAA, uh, is using its discretion and not imposing penalties for non-compliance with many of these regulatory rules that prior to March would have been in place. However, again, you'll see it is really on the onus of the healthcare provider. And when I say healthcare, I also refer to behavioral healthcare providers to be providing this service in good faith using telehealth. So you don't have to worry if are we violating HIPAA rules many of those requirements and enforcements are being relaxed. You can use audio or video communication technology to provide services during this uh, public health emergency, as long as it's non-public facing remote communication. In other words, you're not gonna go on Facebook and start talking with consumers or individuals. Uh, it's using non-public communication strategies. Next slide. Typically, healthcare providers, again, also behavioral health providers, um, would need to be providing those services through technology vendors that are HIPAA compliant and that enter into something called a business associate agreement. That is an agreement, a written agreement between a, a vendor of telehealth services, telemedicine services, and the agency, the provider, that puts in writing what each party's responsibilities are around protecting. Uh, health, individuals' health information. Under this notice that I mentioned in the previous slide, 
There will not be a required business associate agreement, however, with video communication vendors or any other non-compliance with HIPAA rules. It doesn't mean that people don't still have to be careful about securing and protecting individuals that they're working with and the information that gets transpired, but understanding that many of you, particularly if you're using an, an audio only, a, a telephone communication, you're not going to get into a business associate agreement with Verizon or your uh, cell phone company. So not to worry about many of the previous uh, requirements and restrictions that are placed on these types of communications. Next slide. I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Rachel. She is going to talk about some special considerations for the use of telehealth with substance use disorder providers. Rachel? Hi. Hi. Um, Hi, can you guys hear me? Not sure if you all can hear me. Um, sorry, I can't exit the screen. Sherry, do you want to do these guys? We even did an audio test with this. I'm not sure what happened, um, Rachel, but we think that you may need to, um, we're getting, you've, you've called in and your computer speakers uh, and microphone are on. And so we need to, um, Sherry, we're gonna unmute you um, to see if you can carry on with Rachel's presentation. And maybe we can, uh, Rachel, if you can try and uh, call back in. Okay, I'll go ahead and Rachel, when you're back on, let us know. So there have been uh, a couple pieces of guidance provided right, around, okay. Uh, there, are, there are a couple pieces of guidance around communication regarding uh, substance use disorder information that I, I wanted to focus on today. The first uh, really has been provided by SAMHSA uh, for several weeks now. It's on their website and it still is on their website. So I believe they still intend for people to know that in the event of a uh, provider declaring or determining a medical emergency exists for an individual, and this is very individualized, according to 42 CFR part two, uh, there still can be communication, uh, a referral, about the individual without the need to obtain consent. Now, that's not a carte blanche, you just get to go out and share information, uh, but it is in response to a provider knowing that someone uh, needs to get treatment, needs to get a referral, needs to have follow-up by another professional, um, but you don't have their consent. It would allow the provider to move forward in the case of a, quote, medical emergency. However, recently with the passage of the, the CARES Act, um, there also was a provision where, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the uh, treatment of substance use disorder information will align with HIPAA regulations, at least during the uh, current federal emergency. That means that if you have a single patient consent to share substance use disorder information, that that information can also be redisclosed in order to uh, continue to provide referral and treatment for that individual without obtaining a secondary consent. So a, a doctor who is, uh, had obtained an initial consent uh, from a patient or a treatment provider, you can include SUD treatment and prescribing information in a referral to a case manager, a specialist, another a treatment provider without obtaining that secondary consent. And that's important for people to be aware of. It also would apply to uh, alignment with HIPAA regulations, we believe, in the area of telehealth. Now, we expect that there will be additional guidance coming uh, in the next few days or several days that will provide a lot of further clarification around various provisions that were in the CARES Act. And this is one that I would encourage you all to pay particular attention to. But for now, we are operating with the notion and, and assumption that um, HIPAA violations would not be identified for individuals with substance use disorder, much like uh, mental health disorder or any other health care condition. Next slide. There has been a fair amount of guidance that's also been provided around uh, using medication-assisted treatment with telehealth provision. The DEA has relaxed their requirements that now allows for more flexible prescription of buprenorphine using telehealth. The uh, new buprenorphine can be described, um, prescribed via telehealth, via telehealth just like any other medication. Controlled substances, the rules have also been uh, relaxed a bit so that um, as long as the emergency declaration remains, um, you prescribe all Schedule II controlled substances um, for people who have not had an in-person medical evaluation. Before, that was always required. But that evaluation can now occur via telehealth. And you see that there are various uh, conditions that do need to be met and you also see the citation where you can refer back to obtain additional guidance and clarification around prescribing uh, medication-assisted treatment. Rachel, Next let's slide. go ahead and do a test to see if we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Much better, thank you. Great, thank you, sorry. Okay, Rachel, back to you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so, um, SAMHSA, in order to ensure that the folks that you're serving are able to continue getting their medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders, SAMHSA has taken steps to simplify access to medications, and you'll see a link to the guidance here that expands flexibility for opioid use disorder treatment. Um, states that have declared an emergency can request an exception to allow stable patients in a treatment program just to receive up to 20 days of medications. Um, and for folks who uh, clinicians determine maybe aren't quite as stable, um, states can request a 14-day supply for their patients. Um, and again, you can see through that guidance the SAMHSA published um, FAQ on medication-assisted treatment during this crisis. Next slide. Um, so now we're going to talk about uh, priorities for remote service delivery to individuals who have substance use disorders. So first and foremost, foremost um, we want to make sure that um, we're, uh, we're making sure patients have access to available harm reduction services. Um, you know, Sherry referred to earlier, you know, this is a, a, you know, a crisis that really we haven't experienced in this country before. And folks who are in recovery are going to be put to test in terms of their 
uh, rec recovery supports and the availability of um, um, mutual aid, you know, it's gonna, it's, we really need to support folks. Um, and so we wanna make sure that uh, there's access to alcohol, Narcan, uh, to prevent overdose or dangerous withdrawal. Those are considerations. Access to bleach kits and supplies. Uh, we wanna be able to review with folks uh, that they have adequate access to um, continued medication assisted treatment as we referenced in the last slide. And then um, help folks connect if they are able to, if they have um, internet services to uh, online recovery supports such as AA or Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Um, we want to identify any mental health, isolation, or re-traumatization uh, that may emerge as a result of this crisis um, and ask staff uh, if there's the capacity to do daily check-in calls with uh, individuals they're working with. Um, when we can, uh, when our, our agencies are able to, and perhaps with some of the um, federal relief funds that may be coming forward, helping folks who don't have access to phones or technology to get access to that. Um, and then also know what healthcare appointments that have been canceled for the individuals that you're serving um, so that we're able to help people check in with people about how they're managing those health conditions uh, or other behavioral health conditions uh, and help help folks to reschedule those appointments when the time becomes available. Some of the providers that may have canceled scheduling uh, appoint appointments may now have access to telemedicine and so being able to help folks navigate that. Next slide. Okay, and I think, Sherry, this is back to you. Yes, next slide, please. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the technology that's being made available here in Washington State, as well as um, some other options that might be available to folks. We know that the healthcare authority has contracted with Zoom for a HIPAA compliant telehealth service. And that is important in that the uh, product, the technology that the HCA is issuing licenses for is HIPAA compliant. We understand that there are some other technologies that are out there that may not be, uh, but, um, I, and I think that the HCA can, you know, address this also a little later in the questions and answers, but the licenses that they are issuing are HIPAA compliant. For those of you that don't have access to that, however, um, there certainly are other options. Um, there is other HIPAA compliant telehealth platforms. Uh, I think Zoom Pro and DoxyMe are two examples. But there are other non-HIPAA compliant products that people may be using, such as FaceTime or Google, for the lack of having something else to work with. And then again, the use of telephones. The Zoom licenses are meant to support providers uh, to provide continuity of care. There are a limited number, as we understand, and the HCA is prioritizing requests for, for providers who do not currently have telehealth capabilities. There is an online application process for requesting this service. Um, you see that uh, link on, on the screen there. And then contract providers ACA will provide via email instructions once the application is approved. And they have, have posted Zoom telehealth FAQs, which are also accessible through this link for those of you who might be new to using Zoom uh, to help you through that um, process. Uh, we did talk about, you know, obviously the HDA is, is making this technology available. There also are uh, some other funds that are being made available uh, through that CARES Act, through the federal uh, legislation that was recently passed, there will be about $200 million for grants to providers to increase uh, their access to telehealth technology and communication technology. So watch for uh, those grant announcements and how, uh, as a provider or through the state agency, you might be able to access those resources. Next slide.
Because we use Zoom a lot uh, at the Technical Assistance Collaborative, we have used technology before and we are also, now that we're all working remotely, using it all the more. Uh, we can speak to some of these tips. We've uh, experienced some of these challenges and just want you to be aware you do have to exercise a little bit of patience in moving to technology. Using products that are not HIPAA compliant, uh, you really should inform consumers or clients on the other end that technically there can be privacy risks. Um, this is a little tricky. Certainly, we understand that how you explain to someone, well, it's not HIPAA compliant, um, it's not an encrypted message, et cetera. Uh, you may want to come up with some uh, agreed upon language to help people just understand you're minimizing and you're protecting and you're doing everything you can to protect their information within your capabilities. Uh, but you want them to be aware and to be agreeable to participate in remote communication. Definitely suggest that you test the process and have a backup plan. As you can tell, even with our call today, and, and oftentimes when there's high volume, you will have disruption in service. So have a backup plan. If you're using a video screen, I would have telephonic backup and let the individual on the other end know that if you lose connection, you will try to call them or you'll call them back. Something to let them know you didn't just you know, drop off. And again, even within a home where there is bandwidth and where there are wireless plans, the demand on this technology is just, um, you know, unanticipated by their, their capacities, I'm sure. No one ever dreamed we would all be communicating this way. So it can have some, some challenges, but overall works very well. Um, the other thing is when you're contacting someone, and particularly for the first time, uh, if you have a badge, if you're doing a visual, that you can show them who you are, you can verify who you are, who they are, introduce yourself um, in some manner, whether it's over the phone or face-to-face, -face, so that you do make that personal connection with the individual um, as you're trying to communicate. Next slide. It's also important to like any other service, if you were providing it face-to-face, -to, -face, to document uh, what it is that you're doing, the context that you're providing. We refer to an electronic health record here. You may not have the ability to tap into uh, an EHR uh, if you're working remotely or through um, remote communication. If you have to, you can resort to a good old you know, piece of paper and pen or type into you know, a laptop there should be documentation of uh, connections that you're making. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, you're not writing a book. We would encourage you to consider all of these uh, items when you are documenting a contact, though, where the person is, your location as a staff person or provider, if you're, you know, communicating from your home, that it is a telehealth contact. Um, the, the date and the start and stop time are important for billing purposes. Um, certainly you want to document too that you explain to the individual that you are uh, communicating remotely and that they agree to that type of uh, communication. If there's anyone else who's involved uh, with the uh, contact, a brief summary of the contact just to state what the purpose and the outcome of the communication was. Um, and it should be as individualized as possible. I, I think we all get into a habit of maybe jotting down the same type of, of note or documentation uh, to create more ability to have expedient documentation. But I would encourage you to try to have something individualized to make sure that for your own reference and the, the client or consumer's reference going forward, someone else, if they had to pick up they would know what your um, activity uh, with them has involved and focused on. And then again, certainly the reason we're using telehealth is to um, you know, promote social distancing but maintain contact and, and continuity of care with the individual. Next slide, and I will turn it back to Rachel. Great, thank you, Sherry. So next we're gonna talk about other considerations uh, for behavioral health during um, delivery during the COVID-19. So 
Um, for consumers receiving supportive housing services or individualized, other kinds of individualized behavioral health services, um, it's important to be able to do wellness checks and assess which consumers are high risk. Ideally, uh, a, a program supervisor, uh, clinical supervisor will help their, their team identify which of the individuals that are being served fall into this higher risk pool. Um, considerations should include uh, the length of time individuals have been housed. Um, that is, that if somebody just recently been placed in housing, that they may be rise up into a higher risk category because they're not possibly used to that housing location and site. Folks who have active substance use, people who are known to um, socially isolate, uh, consumers who have a history of self-harm or suicidality, untreated mental health systems, um, individuals who um, have a history of being uh, victims of domestic violence or perpetrating domestic violence. So use of telephone or web-based interface um, should, should occur in these check-ins um, of high-risk consumers daily if possible. Um, for high-risk consumers where home visits are needed, the priority is on ensuring staff and consumer safety. Next slide. So when telehealth isn't an option, um, options to consider when telephonic or web-based check-ins aren't possible um, would be first to check with other providers uh, the consumer is connected to to determine whether they're able to provide um, coordinated uh, service delivery, outreaching to consumers, friends, or family where you have releases to talk with folks to um, see if they're checking in on this individual and how they're doing. Uh, securing cell phones with prepaid plans for consumers and dispensing those if possible. Exploring uh, the, distributing like Chromebooks or other web-based communication devices, um, tablets, um, and stop by if needed, but follow the C CDC guidelines um, and considerations for home visits. And we're gonna talk about those right now, these considerations on the next few slides. Okay, so if, a, if home visits have to occur um, because you have exhausted all other options, um, identify staff uh, on your team uh, that have no health-related vulnerabilities um, of their own, as documented by CDC. Um, and so we want to restrict home visits to staff who don't have any of these known related health vulnerabilities, who also have no signs and symptoms of respiratory infection, who have not traveled internationally uh, to countries with sustained community transition, and no known contact with someone uh, with or under investigation for COVID-19. Um, determine if you reside in a community where a community-based spread of COVID-19 is occurring. Right now, it seems like that's very much of the country. Uh, refer to CDC guidance for exposure that might warrant restricting even asymptomatic healthcare personnel from reporting to work. And then you have a link here to the CDC um, website. Next slide, please. Okay, so home visit protocol um, would that uh, to consider before sending a staff person who doesn't have any of those known risks, um, no existing, uh, um, Sorry, uh, yes, that's fine. Uh, so before entering anyone's home, uh, you should sanitize your hands so you don't bring germs in. Before entering, ask about each of the following specific symptoms consumers and others may have um, at the doorway when you arrive. Keep to face-to-face -face visits um, and have those be, all face-to-face -face visits be as brief as possible. Um, keeping six feet away from all individuals in the home and wash your hands immediately upon exit of the home. Now, there's some preparation that needs to go into prior to your visit, 
um, to make sure that you are keeping that, that visit as brief as possible and being prepared to offer um, you know, resources and support and materials when, when you go to that door. Um, next slide, please. So having the following supplies with you for your home visit, hand sanitizers if available, you know, bleach wipes, disinfectants, garbage bags, um, masks. Um, I think now more and more is coming out, you know, about whether we ourselves should be wearing masks and, you know, the CDC and, and uh, the White House and uh, Surgeon General are all, you know, consulting about that right now, even as we speak. Um, so you may want, when, when supplies are available, to mask yourself as well as having masks so that when you go to someone's home, if they're coughing or feverish, you can help mask them. Um, water bottles, um, to toilet paper, garbage bags if available um, so that consumers don't have to go out and get supplies. And oftentimes people may not have money for those supplies. Next slide. And here are some um, sort of um, decision tree around what to do if an individual is exhibiting symptoms. So a cough plus fever, offer a mask and refer to their healthcare provider or urgent care. Um, under the uh, following two scenarios, cough, shortness of breath, call the primary care provider, local health department or 911. Similarly, cough, fever, shortness of breath, um, call primary care provider and local health department 911. This may vary by local guidance, and we do give you a link um, later on in the presentation to where you can find that information. Next slide. Okay, so treatment priorities, individual treatment priorities, um, when you do um, speak with someone, whether it's uh, telephonically, whether it's through a video like Zoom or face-to-face, -face, acknowledge that these are scary and strange times for all of us. Um, I think it's important for uh, everyone to understand that, you know, we're, we're all facing this uncertain time. Um, it's scary. Um, we want to take the opportunity to educate uh, consumers on what the virus is and review um, protocol to minimize risk, social distancing, hand washing, um, cleaning, uh, assuring individuals that they won't lose their housing if they do have a confirmed case of COVID-19 um, as they're able to and based on the jurisdictional directive, they know a lot of communities are um, putting a moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rent. So looking, being familiar with what that um, protocol is in your community is going to be important. Um, being able to assist individuals in accessing food and fluids. Sorry, the slide went back. Uh, I think we're going backwards in the slide deck. We should be on slide 26, Melody. One more. There we go. Um, uh, and ensuring adequate, sorry, Back to slide 26, please. Okay. Uh, adequate supplies and refills for needed medications. Um, leave written materials. The CDC um, and I think HUD have lots of great sort of prepackaged uh, flyers about COVID-19, about hand washing, about symptoms. So um, um, ideally, you'll have those printed and you can leave something because it's difficult, you know, for, for people to always understand just in one conversation um, all of the information that we're giving to someone. And so if they can refer back to it in written material, that's ideal. Next slide, please. Okay, so, oh, no, we're going the wrong way. I think we should be on to 27. There we go. Um, so additional um, priorities, we wanna assess how much food individuals have. Um, if they need help getting food, share resources on how to get meals and food bags. Again, this is something that you need to know before you actually talk with someone, whether it be on the phone or face-to-face. 
ask about safety plans. So do they know who to call and what to do if they aren't feeling well? Um, ask what they'll do with their time. If they have people they can talk to via phone, do they need some additional um, games or, or radio, something to do with their time? Um, ask if the person has an emergency contact that we can take to update our files and ask for current email address and phone number at every visit just to verify that it's correct. We need to be able to get in touch with folks um, sometimes daily uh, as information is changing in our in our local communities. Um, if there's a pet in the home, uh, identify if they have enough supplies and pet food. Is there an emergency plan for coverage? If the individual gets sick and needs to go to the hospital. Next slide. Okay, and for supported employment uh, providers, um, these are considerations that um, you all will be taking as you think about how to continue um, connecting with the folks who are enrolled in your program. So check in frequently with those who you're serving through support employment about the status of their employment. So for those who continue to work, uh, it's important to discuss with them how their current place of employment is exercising precautions to reduce risks of exposure um, to COVID-19, uh, determine if the individual is receiving all available services required to help them maintain stabilization of their health and behavioral health conditions, uh, check in uh, with individual behavioral health care providers to determine their practices. We, we talked about that a little bit earlier too, just making sure that other providers are coordinating uh, with one another. Uh, we want to provide benefits counseling related to changes in income that may occur as a result of loss of employment. Uh, reinforce education around precautions to reduce risk of exposure both in and out of the workplace. I think it's, you know, we can't over communicate um, every time we have an encounter with folks about the hand hygiene um, around uh, making sure that they are, um, uh, you know, keeping things clean and sterile. And again, leave written materials and flyers. Next slide. Okay, and as for supervision considerations, so telehealth technology does allow for continued supervision um, of your frontline staff via a web-based platform or telephone. Uh, document supervision as uh, you would normally document it, uh, except that you want to add that the supervision occurred via a web-based platform or telephone. Consider offering supervision daily given the prioritization of services to identified high-risk individuals. So um, again, things may be changing very rapidly, um, and so it's important that our supervisors are available to uh, staff who are doing direct service regularly um, and checking in on uh, people who are high risk. Consider both increased individual and team supervision so that resources and emerging best practices can be shared broadly uh, and coordinated with other providers. And um, you may want to consider whether you want one or two staff to be the point people, the leads, uh, when individuals are needing to um, have urgent contact with um, clinicians um, so that those staff people can develop those uh, relationships and coordination uh, with those um, clinical service providers out in the community. Um, we want to ensure Supervisors are also accessing updates from public health, CDC, and HUD when applicable in real time. And I think the last slide here, um, we offer you uh, some links to those uh, resources. And this is Sherry okay. again. I just want to jump in to say that these links uh, are extremely important and valuable. Um, we f are finding that the amount of information that is being issued around guidance and policies and updates uh, is happening uh, very, very frequently, sometimes 
several times a day. It slowed down a little bit, but uh, being able to access these links can get you to the most current information, and, and it may change. Something we've said today could actually change through guidance that comes out you know, on Monday. So it's a lot to, to stay on top of, but through these links, we think you can have real-time uh, access to a lot of valuable information that has already been issued, as well as you know, could be forthcoming in the days ahead. Thank you, Sherry. And I think with that, um, Melody, we're ready to, to turn it back over to you for questions or the exit poll questions, probably. Yeah, Sherry and Rachel, thank you so much for all of this great uh, materials and all this great information. We have um, quite a significant amount of questions that have come in and still want to encourage you to send in your questions because the questions that you ask are going to be used in a follow-up series of webinars to get into a little bit more of a deeper dive. And as Greg mentioned at the beginning of our um, webinar that we do plan on um, using this uh, initial overview uh, as a launching pad to then do a series of webinars in partnership with uh, uh, UW. And so um, we'll certainly want to make sure and keep those questions flowing. I want to be able to turn it over to Gail Krieger. Um, uh, we've been sending her some of the questions. And Gail, um, there, do you want to um, maybe see if there's a few of those questions that you want to take uh, initially to kind of give a, a little bit of an overview. I, one of them may be the um, questions about Zoom and with all of the Zoom making the news uh, recently, what uh, is the healthcare authority's position on, on Zoom and a little bit more information about the Zoom platform? Gail, did we lose you? We might have lost Gail. We'll hold on for a second. Um, I, I will say that um, we understand that Zoom um, has been making the news a little bit um, and that there really is, oh, I lost Gail. Gail, can we hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? There we go, yep. Sorry, <laughs> um, technology. So um, yeah, there's there's several questions that came in that are related to the Zoom platform and HIPAA. And so um, let me try to summarize some of them in this way. Um, the agency has created a COVID-19 website. Um, you can Google it with just um, health, Healthcare Authority HCA um, WA COVID-19, and it'll pop right up because that's how I get to it every day, five times a day. Um, the, um, the website has a lot of good information there in regards that will answer your questions because we have created FAQs um, that hopefully inform providers how to bill, what telemedicine and telehealth look like in our environment, and um, and answer a lot of questions that have been put forth here today. Specifically to the Zoom question, there will be a document posted today that is being finished up as we speak, because I checked on it, um, that will be posted about the Zoom licensing and providing some information about that. We have um, purchased a form of Zoom that is um, HIPAA compliant and 42 CFR compliant as stated. It's our understanding that it has more protection than some of the other means that have been um, talked about on the news. Our IT folks are confirming a lot of that and much of what they are um, finding out as they investigate that is going to be what's in that document that will be posted um, later today and provide you some guidance. Um, there are questions here that I've received that are around, um, like, um, will you be given billing codes? Um, how do we put, put place of service? Um, different things like that. I would offer to you, you should really go to the FAQs. I think that a lot of those questions are significantly or, or completely answered um, on our FAQs. 
Um, definitely there is concern about working with clients um, and the consent when you're using a non-HIPAA compliant platform. Um, the FAQs also have some instructions around that and give you some guidance as to how to um, preface that interaction so that you can use an email exchange, um, an electronic signature exchange, um, you can use texting exchange for a written consent, and then how to document verbal consent. Um, there is um, no difference in how we reimburse for um, telemedicine or telehealth encounters if you bill the code that represents what you would have done in service. You will be paid the same reimbursement rate, um, whether it's done through a telehealth or telemedicine uh, modality versus that in-person visit. So the rates have been it all configured to pay the same. There are also opportunities for certain individuals, um, depending on your licensure, to use a set of telephone call or online digital exchange um, codes, and they will be reimbursed the same um, as um, as the code that that represents that um, exchange. And they have been, that is basically for any provider that can bill an E and M. So an evaluation and management code. Um, any other questions that you want me to specifically talk about? Oh, there's a question here around the state of Washington and the boards waiving the HIPAA requirements. Yes. The, um, the state of Washington is waiving the HIPAA requirements, um, and that's not an issue. Um, we are, our, our Medicaid um, law around telemedicine um, talks about the fact that it has to be compliant with federal law, and we now have a new federal law, if you think about it in terms of what has transpired. So we believe that this is not an issue. Um, we are confident of that having talked to the AGs. Um, I don't believe there's an issue with the licensing board, but I'll check with Department of Health. Um, they're they're going to follow suit, so I, I'm not worried about that. Um, I think the message to convey today is this is the direction that we all need to go in, in, in delivering and reimbursing for care. The, um, agency has worked with Department of Health, and we have um, also worked with the Office of the Insurance Commissioner because they have been, um, in essence, following what we are doing to promote that delivery of care. And so um, there's been some activities with the Office of the Insurance Commissioner also conveying to commercials what's expected in our state in regards to promoting telehealth. Um, to render care to individuals, um, regardless of whether they're positive or not, all care is being provided under this um, technology modalities. And so everyone is working um, hand in hand in how to support our citizens to receive care through these modalities. Gail, thank you so much. That is very helpful. This is um, um, one an interesting question from Becky over in Spokane. Um, our direct service pro, uh, staff have spent a large amount of time securing food from food banks and other much needed supplies and then delivering them to the individuals, but they're not spending that much, you know, they're spending time with that individual on the phone, um, but it's not reflective of actually the full amount of time they may have spent on a person's behalf. Would they still capture in their notes the full amount of time or how would they be able to record maybe kind of the collateral work that they're doing on the individual's behalf? Well, I, depend, I think it depends on what coding you're looking to use because that, that question has to be addressed in regards to how were you thinking about coding it? Um, is there a means, Melody, that I couldn't talk directly to that person? Uh, I can try and um, unmute, unmute them. Them. 
trying to find you, Becky. I, I can certainly put you in touch with her afterwards too. Uh, um, That'll work. There. Becky, I've unmuted you. You wanna try and ask your question verbally? Hi, Melody. This is Becky, can, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, yes, a lot of our staff have come to us um, with this concern, and um, I'm assuming that they're just coding it as, you know, an individual encounter because we have peer counselors doing this, case managers, and therapists, and uh, we're we're just putting wellness first before everything, and um, spending huge amounts of time uh, garnering these resources and but then it's only maybe a 10 or 15 minute call with the actual enrollee here's an example of what happened this morning with one of our uh, peers one of her clients is in the hospital with covid and has a 15 year old son living in the home alone needed food uh, he's under restrictions because of his quarantine because of his mother being uh, actively, you know, infected with this. It took her over two hours to stand in line at the food bank, garner the food, get to the home, uh, had to call the son, you know, three different times. None of that counts. She had a 10 minute phone call with the mother at the hospital because she was so exhausted she couldn't stay on the phone for long. So there's a lot of time here that is not being captured uh, in and being reflected in what we're reporting, what, what we're able to report. Okay, so I don't have an answer right off the top of my head about that one. So I will need to check with colleagues about how that would be reported. Um, and I assume that, that you're speaking from an encounter that would be reported out of Siri. I'm sorry, you cut out at the very end. Would you please repeat that? Sure. I assume that you are referring to an encounter that is normally billed out of Siri? Yes. Using the Siri yes. guide? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I'll have to check on that. All right, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, Melody, just you. one more thing. Just one more thing then, somebody wanted to know about the virtual check-ins. That's a, a code, y'all, that is G2012. Um, Medicare is defining it as brief. And so, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you know, they're, they're trying, to, um, trying to provide um, coverage for a, a telephone call. Um, Medicaid is also using that code, but Medicaid's telehealth, telemedicine um, policies that we have implemented are much more expansive than what Medicare has done. Um, and we, even though in some ways we look alike, in this case we do not, and we know that um, Medicaids do not need to look like Medicare. We were basically given permission, if you would, to move away from the Medicare model. Um, it's a different population we serve. Medicare has a different rule maker, um, if you would, than we have. And so um, you will find that there's a significant difference in how Medicare and Medicaid are managing telehealth. And it'll be interesting to see if Medicare steps back and rethinks some of their policies. Um, so um, I can't say what they're doing for behavioral health, um, Medicare, in regards to that G code. Um, it, it originally was created to provide a check-in on clients, um, patients who were COVID positive, I believe. Um, but I, and I don't know, I'm not confident as to speak as to what extent they have expanded its application, but in Medicaid, you can use the G2012 code um, as needed for any interaction you're having um, in behavioral health, and we're, we're applying it to all of our benefits. But the first code in the hierarchy is, is it equivalent, is what you're doing equivalent to a code that you would have used in an in-person visit? If that code meets your needs, then we are 
advocating that you build that code first and how you bill it, um, the instructions for, um, for how to bill it, whether it's telemedicine, um, which is a HIPAA compliant audio video um, interactive exchange versus a telehealth, which is um, not HIPAA compliant if it's audio video and all the other means in which you could interact with someone um, and that's all described in the FAQ, then you would bill it according to the rules um, or the structure that we've provided in the FAQ. Gail, this Melody, um, there's a question in here, uh, uh, and maybe you could address this a little bit about the uh, request that the healthcare authority did um, to have licensed community behavioral health agencies submit uh, their supervision plans when providing telehealth. Um, uh -huh. Can you touch on that one? Yes. So um, in developing the protocols for telehealth, we were, um, in, in working with some of my colleagues in, in the Division of Behavior and Health and Recovery Services, um, many, many of the individuals who practice in a behavioral health agency are agency-affiliated counselors, um, or they are a level of professional that doesn't have a license, per se, under the Department of Health. Um, they are uh, a credentialed um, status. And so what we needed to do was um, we asked the Department of Health if they were going to waive the requirements for supervision for an agency affiliated counselor or for any of those individuals who are not um, fully licensed to practice independently. And we never really got a response back from them. And so in con working with my partners in the um, the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, we thought that it would be better for us to be proactive and um, put a process in place. And so what we're doing um, is asking that the agencies have to be um, responsible for if you're going to have um, providers that fall into this other category following the providing services and interacting independently. So that would mean that for whatever reason, um, you're not in the agency, you're providing services from a, another location where the supervisor is, is not in the proximity that is expected for that supervision component that they would normally provide, um, that we needed to have, I'm gonna call it a workaround. And so we asked for a plan to be developed so that it could be reviewed so that the agency could have some level, if you would, of um, review of that proposed policy and at least be able to document that we addressed that need and understood the need for supervision for those individuals. And we had a process in place um, for making sure that the agencies understood that that needed to continue and how they were gonna provide that supervision. So the instructions for that um, have been shared where the, it needs to be, um, the plan needs to be presented to the agency, submitted to the agency, we'll review it and we'll get back to you as to um, our approval or concerns about that supervision um, protocol. Does that help, Melody? Perfect. Um, so we have a, a few questions. Uh, a, a lot of the questions that are coming in, and I do want to reiterate, as Gail said earlier, that um, the healthcare authority, and mostly Gail, um, developed just this m magnificent FAQ document on telehealth. Um, there's some DCR protocols um, involved. Our, our colleague, David Reed, was instrumental in, in those DCR protocols. Um, so we have a lot of information available to providers on the Healthcare Authority website. And Matt, our um, IT tech on the phone, um, on the on the GoToWebinar, has been posting the link to the um, HCA and so a website that has all of these FAQs and a lot of resources available for people. So definitely encourage you to check a lot of the details of the questions that you're asking are available on um, those FAQs. Um, 
Uh, and Melody, I think it's in, I just want to say, please don't just go check it once and say, this must be the end. <laughs> this must be all I need to know. It's really important that you come back to that website and you look for updates. We're update, we're posting the date that things are updated. I can only share with you, things are changing, not quite as rapidly as they were in the beginning, but they're still changing. And we're trying to keep abreast of that. And we get questions that we realized we didn't necessarily respond to, or we needed to respond to in a more complete way in some way. So your questions are important because it helps us think about what we're communicating and what we need to address. But you all, I'm gonna say it this way, you all have a, have a responsibility to go back and check that, those web pages or that web page for updates because it will impact your practice. And the best way for you to know what the changes are are through our communications on that web page. So this is an interesting question from Kayla um, as that she works as an ombuds uh, and the agency who contracts with us does not have a HIPAA compliant platform um, for communication to individuals requesting ombuds services. Um, and she's asking, since I do not have a credential number, do I have access to Zoom or other telehealth um, services? And so I, I do want to, the, the Zoom licenses that the healthcare authority have been issuing are available to um, not only behavioral health agencies, but also other uh, recovery support, foundational community support, peers. Uh, and so if you, um, in the uh, application, it does ask for you to have a credential number and just put 0000 in that credential number if you um, are applying for one of the Zoom licenses. Um, are, Jenny, Jenna says, there are plenty of services that are offered out there that are HIPAA compliant telehealth. Um, uh, and so let's see, Gregory says, um, thanks for the response regarding the compliance. Being, that being said, HCCA conversa HCA conversations currently are saying that there are significant questions and no guarantee that Zoom Enterprises encryption is in fact in place. Since there are other options that are HIPAA high-tech compliant, good faith may not hold. Um, and I, 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 maybe we want to reiterate the information that we've been receiving from our uh, leadership around the Zoom. If you want to touch on that again, maybe, uh, Gail. So, um, so I just got an email. Um, about, um, give me just a sec here. So there's an announcement on our homepage that we just posted, I think. This is um, breaking news. Yeah, it's dated today. Yeah, it's dated today. Um, and, I, and literally, Melody, I just opened it up as you were speaking. So I'm trying to get my brain to track on the message here. Um, that we've purchased a limited number of Zooms to help with the um, encounters. We've made the licenses available. We've heard concerns about security and privacy of telehealth technology. Want to assure providers who are using HCA purchase licenses that we have been careful to offer licenses that are as secure as possible. The licenses HCA purchases purchased are under the Zoom for Healthcare. This is under the HIPAA compliant business associate agreement. We have configured these licenses to protect against video conference intrusions. And this includes clients coming into an appointment, entering a virtual waiting room, and only and can only be admitted by the provider. Only the provider can share content via video screen, providers sending links only to patients, and recording is disabled. We were granted this license from HC. If you were granted a license from HCA, um, please do so by going to the Zoom login page and supplying the information it requests. I'm not going to go through it. Um, as a reminder, HIP, as a reminder, HIPAA has been waived in many incidents instances um, for the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's important that you protect patient personal health information to the extent possible. We encourage providers to use the account issued by HCA or a similarly secured telehealth solution that you have previously procured. Does that help, Melody? Perfect. Thank you so much, Gail. Sorry, so that just literally just came up on my screen. 
breaking news, breaking news. Like, you know, when we say yeah. that things are changing by the hour, they are literally changing by the hour. <laughs> Truly. I, I do want to um, go ahead and wrap up our, our webinar today. I just want to thank our presenters, Sherry and Rachel. Thank you guys so much. Um, they, this was really uh, amazing that they were able to pull this together really just within the last week. Uh, and so I just can't thank you enough for all of the, um, the great information that you provided uh, to our behavioral health agencies, our foundational community supports, our, our recovery um, service agencies. Um, we are going to follow this webinar up with um, more information, more details. Um, our uh, Greg Claycamp, who is our lead, um, will be working on set up, setting up additional webinars in the future. And all of the questions that we did not get to today um, may be used uh, as topics for future webinars. So please stay tuned. Um, and so we will, um, you're going to actually receive a survey at the end of this. Um, this uh, recording, this webinar was also recorded, uh, and so we, uh, I sent out that announcement over the um, general audience, uh, and so we recorded this, and we will get the, the PowerPoint as well as the recording up on our HCA website. Um, please complete the surveys. Uh, this will help inform our future webinars. Thank you all. Gail, thank you so much for your time, our in-state expert on telehealth. Um, and Matt and Greg, thank you guys so much for facilitating and, and um, pulling this together. And uh, thank you all for attending and stay healthy and please continue to serve the people uh, in Washington to keep everybody safe and healthy. Have a great day, everybody. The webinar will be ending.